got one down. Yeah. 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 Two playback machines. One, two, and three. Roll playback number one. Stand by for voiceover. Cue announcer. August 1st, 1936, WBN, the World Broadcasting Network, your network of the Olympics, brings you a special Ready Saturday edition Nancy? of Good Brad. Morning Five, World half, with four, your hosts, Brad three, Chase and two. Nancy Brown. Good morning, everyone. Brad Chase here with Nancy Brown. And today's the day, the opening of the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. 7 a.m. here in New York early afternoon in Berlin. In just a little while, Chancellor Adolf Hitler of Germany will preside over the opening ceremonies of the 11th revival of the modern Olympic Games. And we here at WBN are proud and happy to be the Olympic network that will bring you the drama and pageantry of these two weeks of competition when more than 4,000 young men and women athletes representing 49 countries will be striving to go to the top step of the victory platform. Our Olympic team of broadcasters and technicians has been setting up shop in Berlin for many weeks now, getting ready to bring you all the action and behind-the-scenes stories of this, the world's greatest international sports event. So let's switch now to our correspondent, Bill Cassidy, who is standing by at Berlin Olympic Stadium. Bill? Thank you, Brad. From the airship Hindenburg, the pride of the German Zeppelin fleet, you're looking down at the Berlin Olympic Stadium. In a little less than three hours, these empty seats will be filled with more than 100,000 people. I'm standing at the urn, which will hold the Olympic flame throughout the games when the final torchbearer arrives later on this afternoon. But right now, Hal Jones is at the Lustgarten, a few kilometers from here, which is where the torch will be arriving shortly. Hal, what's happening over there? As you can see, the uh, torchbearer, flanked by a few runners, is moving toward us here at the Lust Garden. Uh, and he should be here in just a few minutes. And when the torch arrives, there will be a two-hour hold. Uh, already gathered here at the Lust Garden are some uh, 25,000 youngsters from the Nazi youth organization, the Brown Shirts, uh, as well as 40,000 stormtroopers, uh, the SS troops, Chancellor Hitler's own special forces, as well as uh, members of the regular army. Of the swastika, the emblem of the National Socialist Party, hangs throughout the Lust Garden, which for the last couple of years has been the scene of massive Nazi party rallies. Now, when the flame arrives, Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels is expected to make a short speech. So now as we take another look, as the torch winds its way here, let's go back to you, Brad and Nancy. Thank you, Bill. We'll be going back to Berlin in just a few minutes, but first, on this very special Saturday edition of Good Morning World, Let's go to Sam Landers at the news desk. Thank you, Brad. Good morning, Nancy. It is ironic that as the youth of 49 countries gather in friendly, peaceful competition at the Olympic Games in Berlin, there are ominous reports of war and strife coming from different parts of the world. There is heavy fighting in many Spanish cities, in this the second week of the Civil War. Bob Carmichael in Spain has the story. What started out just two weeks ago as a minor revolt against the government in a few small provinces has developed into a full-fledged Spanish civil war. The Spanish government appears to have completely misinterpreted the size of the rebel forces who have sprung up all over Spain. Many political experts are of the opinion that the rebels are the better organized force and feel the government side is in almost total disarray. Here in Toledo, as you can see, the civilian population is behind closed doors, anticipating further fighting. The rebel commander-in-chief is identified as a former colonel in the Spanish army, Francisco Franco, who is now stationed at rebel headquarters in Coetas, Spanish Morocco, where some of the strongest fighting originally took place. From Toledo, Spain, this is Bob Carmichael. From Rome, there is news today that Benito Mussolini has appointed his son-in-law, Count Ciano, as Italy's foreign minister. David Ford is in Rome with a story. As Italian troops finish their drive through Ethiopia at the end of this bloody year-long invasion, Premier Benito Mussolini is solidifying his international position today diplomatically. This morning, he announced that his son-in-law, Count Ciano, will become Italy's foreign minister. This follows the recent announcement that Italian King Victor Emmanuel has been proclaimed emperor of Abyssinia. Deposed Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie is still trying to gain support for the Ethiopian cause. His speech at the League of Nations was disrupted by Italian hecklers who booed and hissed him and caused a temporary threat to his life when the lights in the Great Hall went dim. The Emperor has since sought refuge in Great Britain. But before he left for London, he graciously consented to come before our world broadcasting camera. 
à lutter par la parole et par la plume. De la décision de l'Assemblée de la Société des Nations dépend la paix du monde, car le crime commis contre notre peuple se renouvellera demain à la rencontre d'un autre peuple s'il demeure impuni. Meanwhile, back here in the States, the presidential campaign is starting to heat up with the election just a little more than three months away. White House correspondent Mike Peterson covers the story. The president is relaxing today aboard his yacht Siwana with two of his sons, John and Franklin Jr., getting some needed rest before the arduous campaigning he will undertake over the summer. The president, an avid sailor and who was assistant secretary of the Navy during the Great War, is basking not only in his favorite sport, but also because of the glowing reports he's been receiving from the press and the public over his nomination acceptance speech. Now, as always, for over a century and a half, the flag, the Constitution, stand against a dictatorship by mob rule and the overprivileged alike. And the flag and the Constitution stand for democracy, not tyranny, for freedom, not subjection. Meanwhile, President Roosevelt's opponent, Governor Alfred Landon of Kansas, is keeping to domestic issues, blasting the president's highly controversial federal taxation plan. This is the most cockeyed piece of tax legislation ever imposed in a modern country. And if I'm elected, and if I am elected, I shall recommend the immediate repeal of this vicious method of taxation. From London, what has been a rumor for many months has finally become the most talked about conversation piece in British social and political circles, and now is beginning to be reported almost daily in British newspapers. Dorothy Thomas has a story in London. When King George V died last January, all of Great Britain went into mourning over the death of their beloved king. In the funeral cortege were the heads of many European states, many of whom were related to George V. Though grief was widespread, they took comfort in the realization that George V's son, Edward, the Prince of Wales, would make a worthy successor. But recently, stories, first as unconfirmed rumors, but now apparently well substantiated, have linked the Prince of Wales with an American divorcee, Wallace Simpson. In these exclusive films, the Prince and Mrs. Simpson in bathing costume are seen sunning and boating like any ordinary couple. One reliable palace source informs me that the Prince is very much in love with Mrs. Simpson and wants to make her his wife. If this occurs, a constitutional crisis will arise. British law forbids a king to marry a divorcee. From London, this is Dorothy Thomas. Back to the Good Morning World Show with your hosts, Brad Chase and Nancy Brown. As you know, Bill Cassidy, who was at the Olympic Stadium, has been with the American team from the time they left New York some 17 days ago. And he's standing by with a special feature on the American team. Bill? Well, thank you, Brad. Right now, the American team members are boarding buses in the Olympic Village that will take them to the staging area behind the Marathon Gate, where they'll join the other 48 countries for the opening day ceremonies. Today, there's a mixture of excitement and nervousness. When we first boarded the SS Manhattan in New York more than two weeks ago, it was a completely different feeling. There was the joy and exuberance and free-spirited relaxation that takes place at any Bon Voyage party. The media was out in force, and Olympians, like anyone else, do all the crazy things the average tourist does when someone points a camera at them. The weightlifting team put on a show for the cameras, and one cameraman asked the great Jesse Owens if he'd hop over a rope like he was practicing for a hurdle race. Realizing my ambition for the past four years to become a member of the United States Olympic team, I'm going to try to bring back three crowns, that is, in the 100 meters, 200 meters, and the broad jump. Well, after all the mugging was over, the SS Manhattan pulled away from the dock to a symphony of stirring music from the massed bands that combined with the whistles and horns from the tugboats that were trying to outdo the blasts from the SS Manhattan. But once underway, it was all business. Our women's track team came on deck and began their daily warm-up and training sessions. But perhaps the most sought-out Olympians by the cameramen were three of our potential gold medal winners, Glenn Cunningham, who will compete in the 1500 meters, Jesse Owens in the sprints and the running broad jump, 
and Glenn Morris in the decathlon. I know that Germany's going to have the toughest team that we're going to have to compete against. And, uh, of course, you're going to have to watch all these boys, but you're going to have to watch these Germans in particular. Yes, I understand that uh, they have some very fine spinners, and also, in their field events, they have a very fine broad jumper. I also hear that they have some very fine boys from other countries. That is, this boy Heine from Sweden is very, very good in the 100 meters. And Glenn, I hear quite a bit about the boys in the uh, decathlon. Now, uh, will you give us a lowdown? Well, uh, I understand, Jess, uh, that they're having several very good decathlon men this year. One fellow in particular from Germany is very good. This uh, Stork, I believe his name is, very fine javelin thrower also. Well, after nine days aboard the SS Manhattan, we finally arrived in Hamburg. The German press was particularly interested in our young diver, Marjorie Gestring. She's only 13 years and eight months old, a blonde cutie, the baby of the team. But baby or not, she's one of our main hopes to win a gold medal in the women's springboard diving. I'm also glad to have made the Olympic team, and I'm also glad to be in Germany, and I think it's beautiful. And I'm the youngest member of the team, and I hope to do my best. Once in Berlin, we toured the city in buses, and the city was decked out with banners and flags everywhere, and the Berliners came out in force to cheer us along the way. En route, we stopped at City Hall and were greeted by the mayor. Tausende von Berlinern freuen sich mit uns, dass sie so zahlreich in die Reichshauptstadt gekommen sind. Fühlen Sie sich in unserer Stadt wie zu Hause. Sie werden damit uns alle, alle Berliner, glücklich machen. And then it was off to the Olympic Village, and Frederick Rubian, the secretary of the United States Olympic Committee, thanked the Germans for their warm welcome. The American Olympic team has just arrived at the German Olympic Village and find it a beautiful spot, and it reflects great credit to the German Olympic team and the management of this Olympic Village for the wonderful work they have done. I thank you. All right, thank you. In the village, the individual American teams lined up with the photographers, and our boxers came up with their own cheer. Ray, 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 USA, A-M-E-R-I-C-A, Berlin, Berlin, Berlin. The German hosts are meticulous in their attention to their guests. Every team that arrives, large country or small, is given the same treatment. A little bit after the Americans checked in, the Japanese team arrived, and we were all surprised how well they spoke English. Uh, the uh, Olympic Village in which we have just arrived is wonderfully constructed, and it is far beyond our expectation. And we are fully contented, and know that we will enjoy our life here to a heart's full content. Well, for the moment, that's all from in front of the Olympic Stadium. The American team and the teams from all the other participating nations have boarded their buses and are now on their way here for the opening ceremonies. Brad, Nancy, back to you. One of the British Olympians who we'll be following closely is a man that very few of us have heard about here in the United States, but he's a national hero in Great Britain. His name is Jack Beresford, and the British have already let it be known that Beresford will be their standard bearer, carrying their flag during the opening day ceremonies. And for very good reasons. This will be Jack Beresford's fifth Olympics. He's a sculler, and probably one of the best and most versatile in the world. He's 37 years old and going after his fifth medal. Here in Berlin, he'll be trying for his third gold medal, this time in double skulls. Earlier this week, we asked him about his chances. I love the joy of the competition, and as long as I stay competitive, I'll continue. Do I have a chance for another medal? Of course. But I'll be looking for the gold. Isn't that what this is all about? <laughs> 